pleasure of introducing Pastor Ben Glupkers, who, who is here with us this morning. We are finishing up our pulpit swap series, which we did way back like in April, and then we had an ice day, and we canceled, and everything got messed up. And so this morning, we get the pleasure of finishing up that series. And so Pastor Joe is off traveling, and Pastor Ben Glupker is here with us. He's from Springview Church down in Davisburg. And so we're excited to have him with us this morning. He's been here a few times, and, and he does a great job. So we're, we're grateful for him. He's got a history of, oh, teaching some history back in the day, a little Bible stuff, all kinds of stuff, right? And now he's a pastor down at Springview. So anyway, we welcome here to welcome welcome him here to FBC. Thanks for being with us, Ben. Yeah. Well, good to be with you this morning. Yeah, Pastor Joseph is traveling. I hope he traveled down to Davisburg to Springview Community Church, or there's a big gap in their program this morning. So hopefully that's the way that worked out. It's really good to be back with you again. I uh, really appreciate this church. This is the third year, I think, now that I've had the opportunity to come back here and have enjoyed it every time I... Uh, appreciate and respect your pastor so much and you are blessed to be led by him and, and Nate and all these uh, great elders and it's uh, just good to be here good to enjoy this worship time Corey is still using some key moves I taught him when he was in junior high and I'm, I'm really proud of that that I'm able to be so helpful to him and to you through him um, great to be here this morning turn to your Bible if you would to John chapter 15 John chapter 15 I want to address a question, an issue with you this morning, and this is the, the issue, the question I want to address. What is your Christian life missing? What is your Christian life missing? Now, there's a good chance we've just come off a great time of worship and prayer together, and at this particular moment, maybe it doesn't feel that way, but, but if you're anything like me, I know that there are lots of moments in your days and in your weeks where, where it feels like something in your Christian life is just missing. I don't know about you, most days I feel, I feel like a second-rate Christian. I just do. I, I, I'm usually much more aware of my spiritual failures than my spiritual successes. Uh, I'm usually much more aware of how short I fall rather than how far by God's grace I've come. Sadly, often I am much more aware of my sin than I am of the Savior. And I think a lot of us live lives wanting, desiring to follow Christ, but doing it with this vague sense that something's just missing. That somehow our spiritual lives just fall short somehow. And we might blame it on a number of different reasons. You might say, well, there's just something wrong with me. There's just something wrong with me. There's, uh, I've just been doing it wrong all along somehow for some reason. Uh, or maybe, maybe many of us, we look at our past and we say, I, I messed up so bad in the past and I'm sure that's going to sabotage my present and my future. That, that maybe there's just something deeply inherently wrong with me that keeps my spiritual life from being what I want it to be. The problem's us. Or maybe you don't blame yourself. Maybe you're more into blaming other people. It's not your fault. It's, uh, it's the way you were raised. Your parents did this to you. Or maybe it's how you've been treated by other Christians. And that's just set you on a bad path spiritually and is, is holding you back. Or a difficult life circumstances that many of us have endured. Maybe it's your church's fault. Pastor Joe's not here. Let's blame him. It's... Maybe it's not other people, or maybe it's not you, it's, it's your, someone else that you blame. Or maybe you're chasing the dream, the idea that there's some trick, there's some hack, some secret that really spiritual people know and practice that somehow you've just missed. And if you could just find what that trick is, what that practice, what that spiritual discipline, whatever it might be, if you could just figure out what that thing is, that would just catapult your spiritual life and get it out of the doldrums and into that place where you really want and think it ought to be. I think many of us feel like there are parts, something in our spiritual life is just missing. Although it's possible that you're not struggling at all. Not because you figured it out, but because you've just kind of given up. Maybe you never were following Christ. Or maybe, maybe you were, but at this point you just tell yourself, well, at least I'm a Christian, at least I'm not going to hell, and I'm just not going to really mess with the difficulty and struggle and trouble 
of trying to take my spiritual life, see it go to the next level. Listen, whether you're struggling or have given up, Jesus' words here in John 15 this morning can change everything for you. They really can. In John chapters 13 through 17, we'll be right in the middle of chapter 15 this morning, but in John chapters 13 through 17, all happens at the same time, more or less the same evening, Jesus and his disciples are gathered together the night before he's going to be crucified. They are just becoming aware that something very significant in their spiritual life is about to go missing. Jesus himself. For three years, they've been with him nonstop. Where he went, they went. What he ate, they ate. Where he slept, they slept. When he got abused and punished, they got abused. And it, three years, they've been with him nonstop. And now he's starting to say things like in chapter 13, you know, where I'm going, you can't follow. And they're like, what? What? Or chapter 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. They've been with Jesus all of this time, and all of a sudden, it's just starting to become clear, he's going somewhere, and we're not going with him. The most significant thing in their Christian life is about to go missing, Christ himself. Jesus knows how they feel. Jesus knows how you and I feel. He knows and understands the struggle. So his words here today are incredibly helpful to us if we'll receive them. Let's look at them. John chapter 15 and verse 1. This is God's word, Jesus speaking. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. But if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish. It will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning as we look at your word, we want our joy to be full. We don't want to settle. We don't want to be content with lesser, cheaper joys than the one that you offer us in Christ. And Lord, we will go throughout this day and this week, maybe this very hour, distracted and tempted by lesser, inferior, unsatisfying joys when you offer to us infinite, never-ending joy in relationship to your Son. And so this morning, I pray that we would be drawn deeply, earnestly to Jesus. I pray as we look at your word that you would help us to, to see what it says, to understand it, to embrace it, believe it, and obey it for your glory and our joy in you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus says here, I am the true vine. Jesus isn't really a vine, he's a person. It's a metaphor, an agricultural metaphor common to his day. Probably most of us don't deal very much with vines, but that imagery would be well known and often seen by people in Jesus' world. Vines produce grapes. Grapes were made into wine. It's an agricultural metaphor well understood by them. And what Jesus is going for here isn't hard to understand either. What Jesus is saying here is, here's a good way to think about the way we are here together. Vine produces grapes. Grapes make wine. Wine was very commonly used. So the vine was a symbol of prosperity. It was a symbol of fruitfulness, of vitality. 
It was a symbol of life itself. You remember in the Old Testament, Israel has been delivered by God from the slavery in Egypt. They're headed toward the promised land. And what's one of the things he tells them? When you get there, you will have vineyards that you didn't plant. That's part of the blessing. You will inherit these vineyards. They will be yours. It's not hard to see what Jesus is getting at here. Jesus is saying to them, the spiritual life and vitality that you want and need, Jesus says, is found in me. I'm the vine. I have roots. I'm where the life comes from. You are the branches. The spiritual life you're looking for is going to be found in me. It's not just an agricultural metaphor. It's a historical one. Jesus doesn't just say he's the vine. He says he's the true vine. He's the true vine. You know, often in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, are pictured as God's vine or his vineyard. This is what God expects from them. He expects them to live in the land he's given them, to be fruitful, to be blessed by him, to be a shining example to all the nations. Look at what Yahweh, look what the God of Israel does for the people who are in covenant with him. Look how this God treats his people. Look how he blesses them and cares for them when they are faithful to him and keep covenant with him and obey his laws and don't worship any other gods. Look, and all the nations around them are supposed to see Israel planted in the land, fruitful like a vineyard, and they're supposed to come streaming to Zion because look how this God cares for his people. That's what's supposed to happen. But you know what actually happened. They don't keep covenant. They don't obey God's law. They chase after other gods. And rather than blessing them, rather than pouring out constant blessing, rather, instead they become a byword. They become a, a blight because he disciplines them to bring them, constantly disciplining them to bring them back to himself. There's a famous passage in Isaiah 5. We won't take time to look there this morning, but it talks about how God has a vineyard, how he's loved it. He's tenderly cared for it and tended it so that it would produce good fruit. But here's what actually happens. Isaiah 5, 7. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice. That'd be good fruit. And he found bloodshed. It's bad fruit. He looked for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. They are supposed to bear good fruit. They're supposed to be his vine. They're supposed to be a picture. Look at what it looks like when God, with his temple and his presence among the people, look what it looks like to live with this God, but they fail. Now, 700 years later, 700 years after Isaiah, Jesus comes and he says, I am the true vine. He's saying, I'm God's vineyard. He's saying, you want to see what it looks like when God dwells among men? Jesus says, look at me. This is what it looks like when God dwells among his people. It looks like Jesus. That's the life that they long and you and I long to live. Do we ever need that life? Lived with Jesus. In verses 7 and 8 in John 15, highlight what we're really looking at this morning. They encapsulate what this life is about. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father's glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Jesus is preparing to go to the cross to leave his disciples, to return to the Father. They are anxious and worried. Something huge in their Christian life, their spiritual life is about to go missing. And Jesus wants to talk to them. What does this, their Christian life look like with him while he's gone? That's the, same issue. That's the same place you and I are in today. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. What does our life with Christ look like while he is there? And what he calls it here in this passage is abiding in him, remaining in him, staying in him, dwelling in him, abiding in Christ. That's the life he calls us to. That's the life he offers to us. What does that life look like? I want to give you four things this morning. Here's the four words. Here's the first. It looks like mutuality. It looks like mutuality. He says in verse 4, abide in me 
and I in you. So not just us in him. Jesus isn't a celebrity trying to build his platform, attract followers, establish a social media presence saying, look, you can be part of what I'm doing here. Sign on. You can be one of my followers. I'll be over here as my tribe grows. He's not saying that. He's saying you abide in me and I abide in you. Suppose that you decide uh, that you need to search out a mentor maybe for your professional development, your relational development, athletic, or whatever it may be. Like, I just, I need someone to help me. And I don't want to mess around with, I mean, I want to find the best. In whatever domain it is you want help, I'm, I'm going to find the best. And so you go online and you Google this and you search and search and you finally determine that this one individual, they are the best. They, the best help you could possibly get in this area is from this person. And so you, you send them an email. Say, I'd like you to be my mentor. I'd like you to help me. And so you get an email back and they say, well, look, there's two options here. For $199 a year, you can join my online cohort, my online community, and you will receive exclusive members-only access to exclusive material that will help propel you to the next level and, and all this kind of stuff. And you're like, ah, $200 a year. I mean, how helpful is that actually going to be? And I'm not really sure. But, but there's option B. There's an option, uh, second option. And option B, it just says, option B is very expensive. Very expensive but it's guaranteed to work. You're like, wow, man. And so you're like, I'm just going to go for it. And you click on option B and nothing happens. Nothing. So you go about your day and you go to bed and you wake up the next morning and you're getting around for the day and your doorbell rings. And you go to the door and you open it and this person, she, she's standing right there. And you're like, what in the world are you doing here at my house? I don't remember giving you my address. And she's right here. She says, you, you chose option B. And option B is, I'm moving in with you. I'm going to be your mentor that's right here. When you go to bed, I go to bed. Or no, vice versa. When I go to bed, you go to bed. And when I get up, you get up. And when it's time to go to work, I'm going to go with you. When it's time to work on this thing that you're working, I will be there with you every step of the way. This is going to cost you a fortune, but I will be here until you succeed. I know what it takes. I've done it myself. I'm here to help you. Look back one chapter in John to chapter 14. Again, it's all part of the same talk by Jesus. Look at chapter 14, verse 18. Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, I, I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And in that day, you'll know that I'm in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keep them, he it is who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. I'll love him and manifest myself to him. And Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you'll manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Good question. Jesus says, you're going to see me. The world's not, but you will. Judas says, how? How does that work? Look at verse 23. Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Abiding in Christ is not about joining his online platform and signing up as one of his friends on social media. You abide in me, he says, and I abide in you. We will come and we will make our home with you. It looks like mutuality. Here's the second thing. It looks like dependence. It looks like dependence. This mutuality is not symbiotic. The two don't need each other in order for each to survive. Jesus doesn't need us. Jesus is God. He has no needs. Everything comes from him. We are all need. We are all need. He has no needs. And so this relationship is one of dependence. Look at verses 4 and 5 again. Abide in me and I in you as the branch can bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? 
What? Nothing. So let's list all the things that we can do apart from Jesus. You, you start. Nothing. It is a relationship of total dependence. You can have a branch that's a mile long and 10 feet thick, the most impressive vine branch you've ever seen. And if it's not connected into the vine, it's shriveling up and dying as we speak. No fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's why in verses 7 and 8, we have to ask him for things. What things? Everything. Everything. That's how we glorify him. We glorify him not by helping him out, but by depending on him. You do realize, don't you, that God wants it to be that way. He wants you to depend on him. He wants you to be needy. You can't come to him too often asking for things. We've got six kids at our house. My oldest son, Owen, who was almost 11, is here this morning. So I'll exclude him from this. But, but kids ask for things. I don't know if you've spent time around kids, but they, they ask for things a lot. We have kids, uh, not currently, but we've at times past, where like you're in a conversation, you know, an adult conversation. Mothers, I, that's when two adults talk together. You don't see a lot of that. But when um, adult conversation, and, you know, the kids want to talk, and they grab your face and pull them over. Do you, you had that? Kids... Kids ask for things and will wear you out. Our two-year-old asks for things and, and he can't really talk. And so he's, he's hollering for things, but he has his own name for everything. So you have to like follow him around to try to figure out what it is he's actually asking for. And it gets old. But God never gets tired of you asking him for things. He never goes, good grief. How, how, how long is your list? He's just not that kind of father. He's like, I got all day. I got all day. The relationship looks like total dependence because God wants it that way. He wants you to depend on him. You do realize, I hope, that, that Christianity is utterly unique in this way. It is unlike every other religion. In every other religion, the, the metaphor may be different, but the idea is the same. You bear fruit, and then you can get connected to the vine. You want the vine, you want Jesus, you want God, you bear fruit, and then you get connected. First you prove yourself, then you're accepted. And naturally, we, we just assume it's the same way with Jesus. I prove myself, and I bear fruit, and then I can be connected to him and to his vine. That's why we despair about our spiritual lives. It's, it's why we feel like something is missing. We know we fall short. Every day we fall short. We know we have a long ways to go. We know our lives bear far less fruit than we want them to bear. But see, with Jesus, it is exactly the opposite. He doesn't say, you bear fruit and then you can be connected to me. He says, why are you trying to bear fruit on your own? The first thing you need to do is come to me. You start by coming to me empty-handed, feeble, and dead, and I will give you life, and I will make you fruitful. First you come to me. We are utterly dependent on him for everything. And that's good news. Christianity starts not with demands, but with an earnest invitation. Would you come abide in me? Why don't you just come abide in me? I will make you fruitful. You just come abide in me. Look, if you, if you had to bear fruit on your own to be accepted by him, how long would that take? Days? Weeks? Months? Years? How much fruit? How long would it take? before he would have you and you would have the kind of relationship, the, the intimate, the uh, close fellowship, abiding. How long would that take if you had to perform and bear fruit to accomplish it? But Jesus is looking for dependence. He's looking for faith, which means that you can be on the right track today. I don't mean everything in your life will be hunky-dory and perfect. It, it, those kind of days, that just doesn't... It's not the kind of world. We live in a sinful and fallen world. But you can today take a big step, a big step 
toward the kind of spiritual life, the kind of Christian life you want to live. It's a sure step in what is surely the right direction. It is a step toward abiding in Christ, depending on Him for everything. Here's the third way. The third word is love. Abiding in Christ looks like love. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide, remain, stay in my love. Notice how he says that. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. The love that the Father has for the Son, the Son says, is the Son that I love that I have for you. How great is a love, the love that the Father has for the Son? Would you care to put a rating on that love? On a scale of one to ten. What is the love that the Father has for the Son? Well, unless my daughter would say it's infinity. Infinity times infinity. Incalculable. The archetype of all love. The greatest conceivable love is the love the Father has for the Son. Look over just two chapters at the end of this whole thing, this whole um, talk by Jesus with the disciples. At the end of chapter 17, he says in chapter 17, verse 24, Jesus is praying for his disciples. He said, Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you've given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world doesn't know you, I know you, and these know that you've sent me. I made known to them your name. I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them them. You see what he's saying, right? Here's the love that the Father and the Son and the Spirit have shared for all eternity. It is the greatest conceivable love. Imagine the greatest love possible that you can imagine and multiply it by some factor of infinity and you're not even there yet. The greatest possible love. And Jesus is saying, look, here's my people and, and I want to bring them into this. N not theoretically, really, actually. I want to bring them into this, into the love that the Father and the Son and the Spirit share. Jesus saying, Father, I want, to bring, I want to bring them. I want them to be part of what we have. And the Father stands back sternly, shakes his head, and no, no, of course not. The Father always listens to the Son. That request is being answered unfailingly. God is drawing his people into the love that the Father and the Son and the Spirit have eternally shared. It can't fail. Abiding in Christ looks like this kind of love. Let me say it another way, the way John 15 talks about it. Uh, several, a couple months ago, I was in Chicago for a pastor's conference, and my wife and I were there, and we spent most of the time with a pastor friend of mine who I've known for a long time, and his wife. And so we spent three or four days, and lots of good preaching and workshops, and you know, going around the city, eating out all the time, but mostly just hanging out with our friends. And uh, you, you, you know, that, that's just a great time. We just had a great time with old friends, and it just has me thinking about friendship how valuable it is, how significant it is to have friends that really know you and really care about you and when you're with them you're just totally free to be yourself and you just, time with them is just delightful, right? Look what Jesus says here in chapter 15, ahead in verse 13, John 15, 13. He says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant doesn't know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I have made known to you. You didn't choose me. I chose you. You see, you were my friends. And you know why you're my friends? Because I chose you. I wanted you to be my friends. This relationship looks like love. Not unwilling, not a begrudging kind of love. A love that Jesus is eager to share. Jesus loves you because he wants you. He has made you his friend because he wants you to be his friend. He is the best possible, the best conceivable friend. And he invites us 
into the love that he and the Father and the Spirit share. Here's the fourth thing. It looks like fruitfulness. Abiding in Christ looks like fruitfulness. And we could spend a whole sermon easily on this, but let's just go through it quickly. This fruitfulness, it says in verse 8, shows that we're his disciples. By this we know we're his um, By this the Father is glorified. You bear much fruit and so prove to be his disciples. It's not that our fruitfulness is the basis of our relationship with him. The basis of our relationship with God is the extraordinary love and grace he's shown to us in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus on our behalf. That's the basis of our relationship. But the result? The result is fruitfulness. And it looks like, we'll just go quickly through this, in this passage we see in verse 10, it looks like obeying Jesus' commands. This kind of relationship that he calls us is abiding in Christ. We are obeying his commands, not because we have to, not because we're uh, right with him based on some legalistic do's and don'ts sort of list, but because we love him. And we know that he loves us, and we know that his commands are for our good. And so we're eager to obey his commands because it's for our joy. This fruitfulness looks not only like obeying Jesus' commands, it looks like experiencing Jesus' joy. That's what he says in verse 11. We read it earlier. That my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full a fullness of joy thirdly this fruitfulness looks like love for one another as we see in verse 12 this is my commandment you love one another as I have loved you and if we skip back two chapters to chapter 13 we he makes it very clear what that love looks like chapter 13 he kneels down and he washes his disciples feet even though he's the teacher and they're the disciples he washes their feet and he doesn't sit back and go are you getting what I'm getting, saying here? He says very explicitly, I'm doing this as an example for you. If I can wash your feet, you can wash each other's feet. Very clear. That love looks like sacrificial service. Fourthly, that fruitfulness looks like, we see in verse 16, it looks like witness to the world. God has chosen them for this task, to abide in Christ, reflect his love, and show the world what life with God looks like. Abiding in Christ looks like mutuality. It looks like dependence. It looks like love. It looks like a fruitfulness that God's work in us as we abide in Christ produces. Here's what Jesus is saying in all of this. With mutuality, he's saying to them, I am with you. I am with you. Not just in theory. I am really with you. In dependence, he's saying, I will help you. I will help you with everything. You say, but I can't. He says, I can. I can. With love, he's saying, I care about you. I care about you. Fruitfulness, he says, I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you. Who doesn't want to be close to somebody like that? Who doesn't want to be close to someone that seeks those things for us? Who doesn't want a relationship with somebody like that? It's the furthest thing from a kind of legalism that says, you know, if you're going to be right with Jesus, you've got to do X, Y, or Z, or else you're just a terrible Christian. It's the furthest thing from that. What Jesus is holding out here is not law, it's gospel. It's not burden, but it's blessing. It's not demand that he's holding out. It's delight in this abiding relationship with Christ. Jesus says, I am bringing you into that kind of life, his own life. How many people do you know who live like that? I wish my experience... I wish my life looked more like that. It's not so common. There's something, it often seems like something's missing in our lives. Who's walked that path before us? This past year at Christmas time, I was given a book. A couple in our church picked this up at a thrift store, uh, which doesn't reflect the quality of the book. It's, uh, the book is called Barakel, God's Miracle. Some of you are familiar with Camp Barakel. I know you've had men's groups that have gone there for men's retreats and such. And the book is by and about uh, Johnny Johnson, who was the founder of the camp. And uh, the, the story of how Uncle Johnny is, he's uh, always been called, Uncle Johnny is... Um, was a pastor in the Lansing area back in the 1940s, and uh, as he served in this church, he began to realize that, that uh, as he took kids out for camping, that that ended up being some of the most fruitful ministry experience that he and his church had. So they started doing it more and more, and they're busing kids for six, seven, eight weeks of summer from Lansing up to Muskegon for these camps. And eventually, as time went on, he began to feel like maybe, maybe God's calling us to go into 
Christian camping full time. This is just kind of what God has gifted us and called us to. So they prayed at some length about that and finally decided to do that, but then they needed a place to do so, and so they began praying and searching all over for a place, and eventually God led them to Sheer Lake up uh, by Fairview, just northeast of Mayo, and so eventually God provided remarkable ways. This story, this book is basically about God re- re- supplying and providing in remarkable ways. That's basically the story of this book. And So they settle on that property finally, and God gives it to them in remarkable ways, and, and then they've got to figure out well, how are we going to set this camp up and using all these different things. So anyway, so I'm reading this book back in January, and uh, I saw something that really struck me as he was talking about that he had just, they just bought the property up there for the camp, and his wife and son were still down in the Lansing area finishing up the school year. And so he said this, that he's living in this little tar paper shack, only building on the property. He says, many times I walked around the lake, around the property, claiming the promise of John 15:7. That's the verse I used then, and, and even when we were still trying to purchase the land. So I needed a verse. I desperately needed a verse. I needed something from God that said, go ahead. I don't know how hungry you have to get to have God really feed you. I don't know how intense that becomes within anyone else. I think it develops in varying degrees in people. But I was in dire need of exactly what God had and which I lacked absolutely. So John 15, 7 was a tremendously great thing for me at that time. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Now, I read that back in January. I thought, wait a minute. Here's this guy trying to make big decisions. Should I leave the pastoral ministry and go into camping? Where should we set this camp up? Where should we get property at? Uh, where, how should we set up the property we now? He's trying to make these big decisions, and he says, I needed a verse. I needed God's affirmation, God's encouragement. I needed to know God was leading us in all of these endeavors. And the verse that was a tremendously great help for me was, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you wish and it will be done for you. And I thought, wait a minute. John 15, 7 doesn't say anything about whether you should leave pastoral ministry or not. John 15, 7 doesn't say anything about, you should buy that property up by Sheer Lake, up uh, near Fairview. It doesn't, say, it doesn't say anything about, you should set your camp up on this side of the lake and build your dining hall here and your chapel here and your ball field. It doesn't answer any of those questions, and yet he's saying, ah, John 15, 7 was a tremendously great thing for me, then and before. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you wish and it will be done for you. How is it a help? How is it such a tremendously great thing? And I think the answer is that Uncle Johnny was much further along the road of following Jesus than most of us are. I think he learned something about following Jesus that we desperately need. And it wasn't a special secret. It wasn't a trick. It wasn't a hack. It wasn't something that had been given to him in some special way. It wasn't an exclusive privilege available only to spiritual high achievers. See, I think if you were to read Uncle Johnny's book, I think you would find him to be a a peculiarly impressive person. Impressive in a way you don't often think about or even look for. I'm sure he was a smart guy, but it's not his intelligence or cleverness that stands out at all in this book. I'm sure he was talented, but it doesn't display any particularly great skill as you read through his story. I'm sure he was a ton of fun, but it's not his sense of humor that really impresses you as you look at this. When you read this book, what you see is the embodiment of what John 15, 7 produces in a person. What abiding in Christ produces in a person. And that embodiment is verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified. And and this whole book is about how God made a name and fame for himself by providing and accomplishing great things in Uncle Johnny and Ken Barakel's life. It's about, by this you bear much fruit. And he did so in Uncle Johnny's life in abundance and therefore proved to be my disciples. That's what abiding in Christ produces. The Father's glorified. We bear much fruit. And we get the assurance of joy of seeing that we are truly his disciples. That's what we need. The thing that's missing from your spiritual life is not something that's being withheld from you. 
It's not a trick or a hack or a secret. What we need is more of Christ. And he's not holding himself back. He's not saying, no, don't get too close. You haven't earned the right to come here. He's not saying it. We've turned away. We've gotten distracted. We've run in all sorts of directions other than to him. And the spiritual life we crave is found in him. And we can start going hard after that today. How do we do it? It's not a trick. It's not a secret. It's not a hack. It's a long-term, day-by-day, moment-by-moment dependence on Christ in which his word is abiding in us. Listen, you can't have this life of abiding in Christ apart from God's word. You can't. It just isn't possible. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, so you have to read it. You have to meditate and I think about it. You have to study it. You have to memorize it. Not out of obligation or duty. Jesus is holding it out to you. This is what life in me looks like. And it's not found apart from God's word. And then as we grow in God's word, as we learn it and understand it and see what his value and his will and his priorities are, it moves us then to pray, to ask him whatever we wish in line with his word. And he answers, not begrudgingly. He loves to answer. He loves to answer as he hears our prayers. We can't bother him too much. We can't ask him too often. He's not that kind of father. Well, as we finish this morning, let me give you three reasons why we must pursue this life. Three reasons why. The first reason is because by this kind of life, abiding in Christ, going deep with him, the father we see in verse 8 is glorified. God receives glory. Because that kind of life, that life that says, Jesus first, Jesus is everything to me, that kind of life brings honor and glory. Because it takes all the other things that God has created, all the things that distract us, all the idols that consume our time and attention and the attention of the world around us and says, Jesus is better than all of that. Jesus is better than all of that. I'm going hard after him. And the Father gets glory. Here's the second reason. The second we must pursue it is for our joy and assurance. By this our Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. We need that assurance. We need that encouragement. We need to know that God is really in us. That he's really working on our behalf. One of the best ways, one of the best ways we see that is when he answers our prayers. We don't see nearly enough answers to prayer, do we? And we already know the reason why. We don't pray nearly enough. We just don't pray nearly enough. And when we don't pray, we don't see God answer, and we are deprived of the joy and assurance and encouragement that comes as God works. Listen, God is not, he is eager for us to speak to him. And we forfeit the joy and assurance that our souls crave because we don't look to abide in him through his word and through prayer. Here's the third reason. The encouragement and spiritual growth of other people. Abiding in Christ is about more than just you. It's a lot bigger than you. I had a conversation recently with a woman whose life is just a mess. Uh, it probably, you know people like this. Maybe your life feels about like this this morning. But her life is just a mess. It's a train wreck. I, her husband treats her terribly. He's caught up in all sorts of destructive habits and patterns of sin. Um, her kids, are, they're grow, the ones that adult, they're growing up and they're a mess. Their lives are on a bad trajectory. And, and as I listen to her and talk to her, it's hard to see any way out of her trouble. You, you just look, I, I, don't, I don't even know what to tell you to do. I pray for you, but I, I don't, it's just such a mess. And as I thought about that, I thought, what, if you could go back, if somehow you could roll back time 20 years in her life, and change one thing that might have charted a different trajectory for her and her family. What if her husband, 20 years ago, had resolved to himself, I'm going to abide in Christ. I'm going to go after him and his word. And I'm going to talk to him about it in prayer. And I'm going to seek him. That it changed his life. It had changed her life. It had changed their children's life and their grandchildren's life and who even knows how many lives. You need to pursue a life of abiding in Christ, not just for you, 
but for your spouse, your children, your family, your students, your neighbors, your co-workers, your friends, your fellow church members. You need to resolve to go hard after Christ. He's not holding himself distant. He's inviting you into this. The mantra, you might as well make your life verse this. John 15, 5, apart from Christ, I can do nothing. That's a great life verse. Apart from Christ, I can't do anything, so I'm not even going to try. I'm going to do everything in Christ and through Christ and for Christ. I'm going to go hard after him. I want to live abiding in him day after day, moment by moment, Often we feel like something's missing in our Christian life. What's missing is available to us. We don't have to go miles and miles. We don't have to wait days, weeks, months, or years. Jesus hasn't walked away from you. Jesus is eager to share this life with you. He shares it with his disciples here because they're worried. He shares it with us in his word because we know we need him. We need him. And he holds this life out to us. Listen, if, if, if you're serious about abiding in Christ, and you should be, let me encourage you to do this. If you go to bed tonight, if you go to bed tonight unsure of how tomorrow or if tomorrow you're going to spend time somehow at some length in God's Word and talking to Him, you're not serious enough. I, I'm not trying to beat you down because I've gone to bed lots of nights like that. But it's like, I want to take the next step. I really want to go hard after Christ. I want to have this life of mutuality and dependence and love and fruitfulness. If you're serious about that, you'll go to bed tonight knowing tomorrow when you're going to spend time with God in His Word and when you're going to speak to Him. I don't care if it's three verses of the Bible and 30 seconds of prayer. It doesn't matter where you start. But if you don't know that when you go to bed tonight, I just can I say gently, lovingly, pastorally, you're not yet serious enough. If you're waiting to see when it's going to happen to you, it's not going to happen to you. You're going to make it a priority. So, for the glory of God, for the joy and assurance of your own soul, and for the good of those you love, abide in Christ. Seek Him in His Word. Speak to Him in prayer. Commit yourself earnestly, joyfully, wholeheartedly to pursuing this kind of relationship, abiding in Christ. Christ. Father, I pray for Frank and Ruth Bible Church. I pray for every person here. Lord, they are well taught, well led by their pastors and elders. Uh, they have been blessed by you in many, many ways. And Father, I pray that for many of them, in the middle of all that, they, like me, need to take the next step. A, a firm commitment to, to abiding in Jesus, moment by moment, day by day. Lord, it's not tricky. It's not complicated. It's, you're you are here to help us do it. And so I pray that we would all resolve this morning to more earnestly seek you in your word, to more passionately approach you in prayer so that you would be glorified, so that we would bear much fruit for your glory and that we would have the joy of seeing ourselves truly your disciples. Father, we thank you for all of this in Jesus' name.